Hey everyone, this is Darren, also known as Bombadil from No Guts No Galaxy, and I'd like to welcome you to the premiere episode of the Mech Warrior Online Devlog. We're going to jump right into the questions for the devs, and the first one is in regards to the newest map, HPG Manifold. HPG Manifold will technically be the 10th map added to Mech Warrior Online. What have you learned about making maps for MWO since first introducing us to Forest Colony back in early closed beta? Lots of stuff. Uh, it's been, it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer because a lot of the evolution of maps has been gradual and sporadic. Um, many different things have been more, more evolved than learned. Um, we, we learned new techniques for texture application. Um, a good example is making a 900 story tourmaline rock not look like it's a repeated texture and still kind of have a glistening sparkle on it. Um, uh, we learned a lot of techniques on how to make a little go a long way. Um, the, the easy one there is modulation, uh, being able to make three chunks of geometry turn into 10 different things. Uh, tourmalines are another good example. You can take one of those tourmalines and rotate it sideways, upside down, every direction. For every tourmaline, there's just as much under the terrain that is showing in its different version right next to it, just flipped. So that helps a lot there. Um, considering what the strengths and the weaknesses of the engine during the concepting stage means a lot, uh, I could put some fantastic stuff in a concept art that the engine just can't achieve. So obviously I'm not gonna be doing that. I've, I've, I have a couple concepts that we just can't do at this moment because we haven't figured out how to do it. So obviously keeping that in, in, in my mind uh, mitigates a lot of problems down the road. Um, I think we've gotten a little better at achieving the scaling cues. Once again, that's still the hardest thing to do no matter what you do. Uh, a really good example there is um, some of the, the plants in, in forest colony, uh, like the bracken, for example, uh, a bracken plant is generally what no more than a meter tall, but in forest colony, they're upwards of three meters tall because if we make them actual size. They basically turn into noise. It looks like a pixelated carpet. We have to enlarge them in order to get a little bit of three dimensional texture on the ground. Uh, obviously this isn't real, but we have to balance it. So, uh, it's, it's, it's tough to find those, those balances. Uh, we're, learning, we're learning better ways of achieving this as we move forward. Um, I think a lot, another point is uh, we study the gameplay a lot. Uh, uh, many people have different ways of playing the game. Uh, you, learn, you release a map, the gameplay is almost predictable. A month later, it's completely changed. People will start to learn the map, new techniques, they have strategies built up. We learn moving forward, how do we make the map? Um, instantly adaptable to uh, the users, make it fun based on how their playing techniques are. We want these maps to be addictive. Um, I think uh, getting back to scaling stuff, I think this is one of the harder things. Um, generally speaking, most games, the camera is only about two meters off the ground. The player can only see about 250 meters in the distance. Uh, they run at about 20K. People in games run fast. Uh, our mechs are anywhere between uh, six stories, two to six stories tall. Uh, they run at 120k, they can fly into the air at ridiculous heights depending on what they're taking off from. So distances are upwards of four kilometers or more. Uh, they run uh, and, and stop and turn and twist and everything's got to stream in at the same time. So we can't have too much detail. Uh, in a regular game, you can have litter and newspapers on the streets. If we do that in Mac, it looks like a pixel. You just can't do it. Your detail has to start up at around two stories and go up to about six or eight stories and, and then from there fade off. So finding those magic areas where it really counts is, is a real art. On to the next question. What is the most used Phoenix Battle Mech variant and are there any predictions for the Saber Mechs? Additionally, are there any other unseen battle mechs being considered for Mech Warrior Online? Well, it looks uh, unsurprisingly like the Shadowhawk was the most popular Phoenix battle mech. Not by a large margin, but uh, the mobile uh, medium battle mech like that with jump jets, um, it looks gorgeous. And it looks like the 2D tube is, has a slight advantage over the rest of them as far as the most popular uh, Phoenix battle mech on the battlefield. 
As far as Saber Battle Mechs go, um, I think the Griffin and Wolverine are both going to be very popular. You get a couple more 55 ton uh, Battle Max, lots of jump jets on them, quite mobile. Um, it's really starting to get the, you know, the workforce of the battlefield, like those medium Battle Max, the way we wanted it. And the only difference I can really spot between them, I guess, that might stand out would be uh, one of the Wolverine variants, I believe it's the 6R, has a ballistic card point. It's the only one of all the Griffins and Wolverines that have that. So I think that'll make it stand out. And there's also a 6K Wolverine, which I find interesting since it has uh, the ability to go to a larger engine than any of the others. It can go up to a 375. And with Speed Tweak, that means you can get going 121.5 kilometers per hour. I built one out with five medium lasers, Streak SRM2, um, BAP, also AMS. And so I think it's a really great um, ECM hunting medium battle mech. So I think that's my predictions, but um, we'll see what the players discover. At this time, there's no other unseen mechs that we're looking to make. That's mostly due to legal restrictions. Um, most people know the story by now, but there's generally three categories. There's Crusher Joe, which is really just the Locust. Um, there's the Dugram category, which the majority of the Phoenix battle mechs were. And there's only a couple more in there that have maybe some potential. And then of course, the rest are the Macross driven um, Harmony Gold mechs. And those are really off limits, even with the kind of extreme redesigns that we've done that our artists have provided on the Phoenix battle mechs. Um, still, there's, there's too much of a risk there and, and um, there just isn't a relationship in place to make that happen. So, at this point in time, I think we're done with the Unseen Battle Mechs, but we're just grateful, I think, that we can bring back some of those classics and finally have them in a, in a Mech Warrior product again. And um, as you guys can see, there's lots of great Battle Mechs coming down the pipe, especially with the clans upcoming, so we've got plenty to do. The next topic is the new Skirmish game mode. What are some of the unique challenges of introducing Skirmish into MWO, and how have you addressed these challenges? Uh, when it comes to adding Skirmish mode into MWO, it wasn't a big task. Um, obviously, it's just assault mode with the bases removed. It's something that the community has been asking for, but at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we covered all our bases in terms of how the gameplay is going to fall out. Now, there were two key issues that we had to take a look at. And the first one was last man standing, where the other team's being destroyed except for the one last guy. That last guy starts running around, shutting down in the corner, trying to hide, trying to stay alive. Uh, that's not the kind of gameplay we want to see happen in skirmish mode. So we're going to be monitoring gameplays. We're going to be monitoring the results of skirmish mode. Uh, we'll be talking with the community or taking any feedback from the community as it comes in through the ticket system of players being reported for this kind of behavior. We'll have to make the kind of, I don't know, fixes at that point. Uh, the second issue that we had to take a look into was scoring. Uh, normally, this, this game mode is pretty much team deathmatch. That kind of gameplay normally has a respawn system behind it. Now, we have a max score for a team being 12 that's destroying the other team. There can be some little odd edge cases where the score doesn't kind of make sense in the win condition, but we've been addressing that and we've actually updated the rule set for Skirmish, and you'll see that in the next few releases in terms of the rules being displayed on the screen as you look into the match. Including Skirmish in the upcoming attack defend mode, will all of the game modes be featured in Community Warfare? And while on the topic of Community Warfare, are there any updates or information you can share? Uh, when it comes to skirmish and attack and defend, it's like I mentioned in the most recent command chair uh, project update, is that they are the first step toward our end goal. And the addition of the resources associated with those game modes are slowly coming online. Uh, you might have heard rumors of a turret system that we're working on. Uh, we're looking to bring in actual bases rather than these resource collectors. So you will have something that you're gonna actually have to assault in order to take over. Uh, we're gonna possibly combine these game modes into a rush style mentality, like rush from battlefield, where it's playing segments of map one at a time. So you attack one section. If you succeed, you move on to the next section. One of the issues we're gonna have in that kind of situation is respawns, and that's another system that we're taking a look at, whether it be respawn system or whether it be the infamous dropship mode that everybody's been hearing about. We'll be making more, more detailed uh, information releases based on that. 
pretty soon because it's currently on the design hot seat. So we'll let you know as soon as we get that ironed out. Uh, community warfare update. Well, the back end infrastructure has been redesigned. Uh, work has begun on this restructuring. Uh, we have a lot more data that we have to track for the new persistent metagame. Things like uh, who owns what planet, uh, state of the universe, things like faction gameplay, all that kind of stuff. Uh, to support the way matches are going to be kicking off, we have to create a new lobby system, which you've heard of from Brian. Um, that includes a matchmaker rewrite that has been designed and it's been reviewed by engineering. It's currently waiting on progress with UI 2.0 to be able to implement new screens. Uh, UI 2.0, uh, the needs for matchmaking to support the new matchmaking to support community warfare that's been designed. Uh, prep work has been scheduled. Um, we're planning on it to be arriving with the launch modules, which Brian outlined in the command chair on the forums. Um, the majority of the team is working on community warfare, community warfare related assets. So it's a hard drive for us, but we are gonna to try to get it into your hands as soon as possible. Um, other than that, we will have to update you as we progress. Um, I'll personally be tracking down basically the stages where I can update you on a lot more frequent basis. Moving on to the subject of UI 2.0, how is it progressing? And will there be more play tests in the near future? And how much of an impact are the play tests and community feedback going to have on the design and functionality of UI 2.0? UI 2.0 is progressing really well right now. Uh, we got a lot of the features from UI 1.5 currently in the build, and we got the new addition of the store, which is a really cool aspect of the new UI. Um, it's all coming together. We're in the last stretch of just doing a bunch of bug fixes and getting it all nice and solid and preparing for launch. Um, is there going to be new playtests in the future? Most likely, they're going to happen in the new year. We still haven't quite scheduled them yet, but they're probably going to happen. You're going to get at least one more before we go for launch. We really appreciate your feedback from the playtests that we get from all you guys. Um, Paul and I actually review all the uh, feedback that the CSR team compiles for us after the playtest. Um, we use it to determine if there's any friction points or any places where we can improve on the UI. Um, with that, we actually will identify things we actually do want to change, and we begin scheduling it and identifying the work. Um, most likely that work will not be in for launch, but it probably will happen in the few patches after. Um, also, a public test is scheduled for the new year, so keep an eye out for any changes that may have sneaked in for that. We've heard it briefly mentioned, but what can you tell us about the upcoming achievement system? Uh, the achievement system uses track gameplay data to reward players. Uh, things like C-bills, XP, items, well, maybe, uh, titles. Uh, the types of achievements include data-driven events, uh, faction-driven events, role uh, events, and a combination of both. Data-driven events are things like get five kills in a match. Faction-driven events would be things like kill five dabbing players in a match. Now, me as a Korea player, I've been tracking that one very heavily. Um, Role-driven events are things like rewarding players who do things, as, for example, a scout. Somebody who does targeting or LRMs, uh, they do that three or four times in a match, they might get an achievement, get a new title, get maybe even some seat bills out of it. Uh, then there's combining the above into what we call nested achievements. So things like kill five players, they just happen to be dabbing in, and you get the kill shot using an AC-20, right? Uh, that means you're a brawler, you're a Krita player, you kill five players off, and you'll receive a special uh, combination reward for that kind of gameplay. Uh, Garth is being placed in charge of writing these things up. Um, I've seen the stuff that he's been writing up. He's doing a great job. Uh, he can update you further in the upcoming task. Today. And finally, on to the clans, specifically clan battle mechs. Will clan mechs change the game? Clan battle mechs, will they change the game? Well, not in the way that you think or that you've seen in the past. 
Um, we've stated numerous times that our goal is to rid the arms race from getting from Intersphere Max to Clan Max and then just never looking back. We've spent the last two years, you guys have been playing for the last two years, some of your favorite mechs in the game. And we just don't want to see that just get obliterated because Clan Max and Clan Technology have entered the game. Um, basically, we want to make sure that Clan Technology maintains its flavor it maintains its kind of feel and lore, but we don't want it to dominate players' builds or what mechs are brought to the battlefield. Um, that being said, it's going to be a bit of an impact. We're going to be playing around the balance quite a bit. Um, some things will just make sense. Some things will kind of not make sense. We'll see. That's totally up to you. Uh, I do follow feedback contrary to what we, some people might believe. But I do follow feedback and I do take into account some of the things the players have been saying online. Uh, a massive write up for all of this stuff has been done and it's going to be coming to the command chair very soon. And by massive, I mean it's quite detailed. It's been written by myself, it's been written by Dave Bradley, um, it's been vetted by the entire design team, it's been vetted by both Brian and Russ. So expect to see that soon. Historically, there are clan battle mechs that feature the Omnimech modularity system. Can you tell us if and how that will be translated into MechWarrior Online? Well, the biggest thing that you'll see is how we handle the hard points of the Omnimechs. On a standard battle mech, you buy the mech and the hard points are all fixed. If Narn has two energy hard points, that's all it will ever have. On an Omnimech, you'll buy the Omnimech in a configuration similar to a variant, and it'll come with a set of hard points, but you'll be able to start to change those around. For example, if uh, the right arm of the Mad Cat A has two energy hard points and you don't like that, you can swap it out with, say, the right arm of the Mad Cat B, comes with one energy hard point and one missile hard point. You'll be able to do this for every location except for the center torso. The center torso is fixed so to allow uh, purposes such as XP and efficiencies and just to identify the mech in that manner. Now, in order to balance out all this uh, customization, there's going to be some restrictions in place, and these are going to be taken from uh, tabletop battle tech rules. For example, every Omnimech is based upon a base configuration with elements that can't change on any configuration, no matter how you customize it. Things like the engine type, or the standard XL, along with the engine rating can't change, uh, the type of internal structure, the type of armor, armor placement, these sorts of things remain fixed and players will have to build around them. In addition, we're looking at incorporating elements unique to MWO into the Omnimech system. Right now, we're looking at incorporating quirks into each part to incentivize uh, what may be perceived to be uh, lesser valued parts. For example, if one right arm has three energy hard points and a similar right arm has only one energy hard point, we can balance that out and give incentives to take the one energy hard point by either giving it a few little buffs or by giving the three energy hard point few little nerfs. And that wraps up the first ever MechWarrior Online dev vlog. On behalf of No Guts No Galaxy, I'd like to thank the devs for taking the time to answer these questions, and of course you, the viewer, for tuning in. If you'd like to submit your questions for possible inclusion in the next dev vlog, be sure to head on over to the forums at mwomercs.com. This is Darren signing off. Until next time, mech warriors.